I'm Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. We're going to be speaking about bedside ultrasound now and just focusing on cardiac ultrasound. So two major questions that we want to focus on when speaking about uh, ultrasound of the heart. What does the contractility look like and is there a pericardial effusion? Obviously there are many, many more applications than this, but in order, uh, in order to get a good sense of the heart function, we can use this rough guide towards the, taking our first steps at cardiac ultrasound. So let's have a look at the uh, axes of the heart. We are pretty familiar with the axis of the heart in terms of uh, using uh, EKGs and looking at the electrical vector. Um, and uh, there's a long axis along this uh, plane as well that we can see here oriented diagonally across the chest. So basically, um, anatomists and cardiologists have defi defined several planes of the heart that we use when we talk about ultrasound views there is a short axis of the heart which is going to be this yellow plane here that is going to slice essentially through the uh, short axis or a transverse plane through the left ventricle and the right ventricle in a long axis which is this blue plane here we're going to have a look at the long axis mostly of the left ventricle and then there is a four chamber cardiac view which is going to take a look through as best we can all four chambers as well so these are the planes of the heart, meaning these are the different ways that it can be sliced uh, using ultrasound. There are also several windows that we use, and the windows are the areas where we actually place the transducer to obtain these images. So sub-xiphoid view, meaning put the probe under the, sub -xi under the xiphoid process, aiming for a four-chamber cardiac view means we're going to uh, try to address the plane of the four-chamber view of the ultrasound through the sub-xiphoid approach. Um, these images on the right here are courtesy of the Yale Echocardiography Atlas, which is an excellent resource online for uh, anatomy, ultrasound clips, normals, and abnormals. And uh, using any search engine, looking for Yale Echocardiography Atlas, they really have uh, an incredible amount of content online. So we're going to place the probe below the xiphoid process, and I think some people forget the sub part of sub-xiphoid. It's not placing the probe on the xiphoid process, but beneath it, aiming through the liver to get a good view of the heart. And thus, we will see an image of the liver towards the top of the screen, the right ventricle beneath that, the left ventricle still beneath that. The right atrium is going to be the chamber that feeds into the right ventricle, and the left atrium is going to be the chamber that feeds into the, uh, the left atrium into the left ventricle down here towards the posterior aspect of the screen that you're seeing. So again, this is a schematic of what that same image would look like, demonstrating all four chambers well. If you want to see a good four-chamber view, we should be able to see the apex of the heart, which we can see out here, as well as all four chambers as well as the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. So if you're off axis, if you're not in the plane appropriately, you're not going to see all these structures. And it's important to try to get to that same plane, not only be able to communicate the ultrasound images that you've gotten with uh, people from uh, other departments, so you're getting the same images that cardiology can get, but also because a lot of the mechanics of how you perceive uh, contractility or the air, way you look for effusion or the way you would look for valve function are really dependent on getting the heart image in a particular plane. And you can get misleading information if you're not in the right plane. So this is what a sub-xiphoid cardiac view would look like. In the top of the screen, we're going to see the liver. And just deep to the liver, we see bright white pericardium followed by the right ventricle. Below the right ventricle or deep to the right ventricle, we see the septum. Deep to that, we see the left ventricle. So just looking at this image, we can get some sense of cardiac contractility. We can get some sense that there's no pericardial effusion, and this is what it should look like. Another helpful view, and very commonly employed, is the uh, parasternal long axis view. So by placing the probe along the long axis of the heart so that the ultrasound beam generated is going to be parallel to the electrical vector of the heart or pointing down towards the apex of the heart or the point of maximal impulse. So this general plane, that's going to generate an image uh, again, thanks to Yale's uh, Echo Atlas for this uh, great illustration, where we see a little hint of the RV outflow track. Mainly we're seeing the left ventricle, from the apex to the mitral valve, and we even see a bit of the aortic valve. And to define the plane of this long axis view, and you need three points to define a plane, that's why tables have a minimum of three legs to maintain their stability, we see you need to see the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the apex all being in the same plane to have a true parasternal long axis view.
So we see again schematically the right uh, ventricular outflow tract towards the top, the left ventricle more posterior, and that foreshadows a bit of what we can do next when we look at the short axis view. We can take this plane and slice through here and get the image we see here where we see papillary muscles and the left ventricle and a bit of the right ventricle. That's most commonly the view that we're going to see and it's the one we're going to talk about next. But if you image in a different plane, you can actually image through the mitral valve itself if you image through this plane or up here um, back towards the uh, aortic root here, you can image through the aortic valve, the RV outflow tract, and the left atrium. So this is a good uh, long axis view of the heart. And again, here we, we can see the mitral valve, I'm uh, sorry, here down towards the bottom, the mitral valve, aortic valve up visible up here. And at the, in the apex is just off the edge of the screen. So it's helpful in this case to fan the probe back and forth, sliding out towards the apex, back towards the valves to make sure that you're in the right plane. So we talked before about the short axis. Basically, in order to get to this view, you rotate the probe 90 degrees, and now you're slicing through a transverse view of the left ventricle. So we can see the anterior wall up here, the septum, and uh, the posterior back here. Typically, this uh, is viewed through the uh, level of the papillary muscles, and it's an excellent view to look at contractility uh, circumferentially through the short axis of the heart. So here we can see the septum here separating the left ventricle on the bottom from the right ventricle at the top and we see the heart beating and sort of concentrically coming towards the center demonstrating good contractility. Another very commonly used view is the apical four chamber view. The probe is held at the patient's point of maximal impulse and you'll see here at the patient position as with all cardiac ultrasound the patient's position is best when they are laying in a left lateral decubitus position. This um, pulls the lung away from the heart a little bit, allows the uh, heart to really press up against the chest wall and minimizes interference and maximizes the view. So um, the uh, parasternal views are aided with this view as well, um, but especially the apical four chamber view is sometimes incredibly challenging without getting the patient into a lateral decubitus view. So what we see when this view is done properly is the left ventricle towards the right hand side of the screen the right ventricle next to it, and then the atria will occupy the bottom of the screen. And this view is uh, not only good for contractility, it's very good for looking at valve function, and it's uh, really the best view for comparing right ventricle size with left ventricle size, looking for things like RV hypertrophy or strain. So again, schematically, we can see which plane we're cutting through the heart in order to generate the image of all four chambers simultaneously. And here's what it looks like in a real patient, where we see the septum sort of running straight up and down towards the middle of the screen. That's the optimal idea. A right ventricle is on the screen left, and the left ventricle is on the screen right. So in other words, the right ventricle in this particular view is towards the probe marker, because the probe marker is held in a position where the uh, probe is towards the patient's uh, right shoulder. Uh, the cardiology version of this view will look exactly the same, except that the dot on the top of the screen will often be found on the top um, on the top right. So the image will be the same, but the dot will often be up here in a, using a cardiology view. So let's talk about some of the basic things that we can look for using cardiac ultrasound. Again, there's a world of cardiac sonography out there, um, but some of the basic applications can be very useful um, at the bedside. So let's look at effusion. Fluid whether it's blood or other fluid, is going to appear anechoic, so black. So we see between the pericardium near the top of the screen here and the heart or the myocardium here, there is black fluid. So this heart is bathed in fluid anteriorly, posteriorly as well, and as this um, sonographer is sweeping through the heart, we can see that there is an effusion around this heart. When effusions become great and they overcome the pressure that uh, the heart is generating, you can see tamponade. Uh, there's a couple classic signs of tamponade. The most commonly described one is right ventricular collapse. So here we see, again, this is a uh, uh, subxiphoid cardiac view, liver near the top of the screen, 
pericardium here. Beneath that, we see a pericardial effusion extending all the way around the heart, so it's a reasonably uh, big effusion. And the right ventricle here that should be opening during diastole and closing during systole is really closed essentially through the entire cardiac cycle. So this is definitely a sign of uh, pericardial tamponade and uh, compromise of the right ventricular function. Here we see another example here where it's very difficult to visualize the right ventricle. The entire cardiac image here isn't great, um, but it still gives the provider an enormous amount of information very quickly. And uh, we see here a huge pericardial effusion, large enough that it probably didn't occur within the last five minutes. There's got to be some chronicity to something like this. But we also see a tachycardic heart beating with a right ventricle that seems squished shut during the entire cardiac cycle. So again, another example of tamponade. Here we see a, uh, a view of the heart where the right ventricle function, again, is compromised. We see a large pericardial effusion, this blackness surrounding the heart. And we even see the heart swinging back and forth. So um, we uh, see how uh, the heart swinging back and forth can dem be demonstrated uh, in, in an ultrasound. Um, and previously, it would just be uh, EKG changes that would show us signs that perhaps the heart was uh, flopping side to side as it was beating but this can be seen in real time with ultrasound. So um, this is a, uh, a table published from uh, current, uh, Cardiology in Review in 2011, demonstrates some of the findings of pericardial uh, tamponade. So um, right atrial collapse, um, right ventricular collapse, IVC plethora, and pericardial effusion are some of the most important uh, signs. And despite the fact that uh, uh, there's probably one or two of you that are paying enough attention to read the bottom here. Um, plural effusion is d described in the table contents here, um, but throughout the text of the article, um, it's meant to be pericardial effusion. So large pericardial effusion is very uh, specific, um, but IVC plethora is probably the most sensitive sign. And there are some people who feel that if you don't have a large dilated inferior vena cava, you don't have pericardial tamponade. So, Let's talk about contractility for a moment. Uh, it's one of the primary functions of cardiac sonography is to look for the contractility of the heart. Let's speak about it in general terms of good and bad and get a sense first of what normal contractility um, looks like. Um, we've actually seen that in the previous um, slides, so let's focus on here an example of poor contractility to sort of demonstrate um, what, we're, what we're going to look for. So first of all, we want to get a just a gestalt. Have a look here. This is a parasternal long axis view. Let's have a look at the entire left ventricle and see whether the walls are coming in towards the center, as was briefly mentioned uh, earlier in this talk. So here the walls are moving a bit, but they're certainly not contracting towards the center uh, with any kind of good effort. And you could imagine that uh, the blood within this chamber isn't really being pumped forwards very well. So step one is imagine the center of the chamber and imagine the walls coming towards it. Are they coming towards it with any force? Uh, and are they coming towards it in a way that you think could generate forward flow? And in this case, they're certainly not. The next thing is to look at the mitral valve. The mitral valve, which is the conduit between the uh, left atrium and the left ventricle should open fairly wide open in a normal person as a huge amount of blood rushes in to fill the empty ventricle during diastole. So a lot of blood gets pumped out. We have a relatively empty ventricle. A lot of blood rushes in. If a lot of blood rushes in through this closed system, the mitral valve is going to open wide open. So the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve should really get very close to the septum as it opens. This is a concept called E-point septal separation, but the, and the gist of it is not necessarily that we would uh, measure it, although you certainly could. The idea is it's one other clue towards the efficacy of each contractility. So in this case, we can see that the mitral valve is opening just a little bit, not getting anywhere near the septum. So again, another sign of poor contractility. A third sign that's helpful to look for contractility is that uh, is remembering that the heart muscle is a muscle. And when a muscle contracts, it should thicken, no differently than your biceps or your quadriceps muscles. So the septum here is moving a bit, but it's not appreciably thickening. And the wall here is moving a bit, but it's not appreciably thickening. So there could be scar tissue or maybe even a lack of motion in that area. So focusing your eye not just on the overall global contractility of seeing the walls encircling the ventricle, whether they're closing in or not, but then taking a moment to focus in on individual areas around the ventricle and see whether that muscle tissue is thickening with each contraction, thickening with each systole is helpful. So here in this view of 
poor cardiac contractility, we really see none of these things. We see a very poor uh, circumferential squeeze towards the center of the chamber. We see very little mitral movement during diastole, and we see very little thickening with each contraction. So again, all signs of poor contractility. Now here as well, we see uh, poor contractility. There's a little bit of movement back and forth here. Uh, it's not terribly organized, and there's not a lot of squeeze towards the center of the chamber. And you can see, even though it's moving a little more quickly here, that the mitral valve is not really getting up very close towards the septum. So again, another example of poor contractility. So in contrast here, we see a heart where, if we imagine being in the center of this chamber, there's an enormous amount of contractility. It almost seems like the walls are slapping together. A bit of that's artifactual from the, the, the heart moving through the plane of the ultrasound beam and not remaining in the exact same plane the entire cardiac cycle, but we can see that there's sort of a hyperdynamic component to this heart where there's actually an increased injection fraction. The mitral valve leaflet here is not only touching the septum, it seems to be slapping the septum, um, that it's opening so wide to allow more blood to come in. And we can see any part of the cardiac muscle that we look at is thickening pretty significantly as it contracts. So in contrast to the heart that we saw before that wasn't contracting very well, and we saw that diminished cardiac contractility, here those same three um, uh, uh, applications looked at the heart, uh, the minimal contractility towards the center, lack of the thickening with contraction, and the, the valve motion, here they're all happening in spades, so demonstrating a healthy heart, a hyperdynamic heart typically something that would occur with a relative um, fluid deficit. Here's a similar concept in a uh, healthy person who is severely dehydrated, a normal healthy heart beating with a um, hypercontractile uh, contractility, and uh, again, the chamber size is getting very small, a lot of blood being pumped out. So we talked about poor contractility, we talked about hyperdynamic contractility, and now we can talk about um, the, another case of contractility where there isn't any. So uh, cardiac ultrasound can be used during uh, arrest situations. Uh, typically we do pulse checks, and they have become less important, uh, and we focus less time on them with each new iteration of ACLS, and for good reason. It takes people a long time to confirm or exclude a pulse. Um, you can see here the percentage of people on the, um, the x-axis who can, um, the percentage of time that it takes to uh, confirm or exclude a pulse, and the amount of time it takes on the, on the x-axis at the bottom here. So uh, y-axis on the top percentage um, that have, were able to confirm or exclude uh, pulselessness, and the amount of time down here on the x-axis. So um, really to get above 90% to exclude a pulse takes you at least 30 seconds, and uh, to confirm a pulse can take uh, upwards of 30 seconds uh, in this study that was done in 2010 in resuscitation. So um, in contrast, we might be able to use ultrasound to do a better job. There are several studies that have published um, 250 and, and, and more patients uh, during cardiac arrest situations, and basically there were, um, only one or, there were only two survivors described um, thus far in all these studies when there was no cardiac contractility visible on ultrasound um, during cardiac arrest. So here's what that looks like. Uh, this is a subxiphoid cardiac view taken during the pulse check um, of an arrest. And what you do is you have the probe ready while chest compressions are occurring. We don't want to interrupt chest impressions uh, you know, at all if it's possible. And during a pulse check that was happening anyway and a rhythm check that's happening on the monitor, the ultrasound probe can be applied to the patient's chest. And we see there's no cardiac contractility. There is uh, no movement of the, of the walls together. There's no thickening. There's a cardiac stand still. And this has an incredibly poor prognosis. We can see a subxiphoid cardiac view demonstrating the same thing here where the anterior um, part of the heart is the right ventricle, left ventricle down here, and we see this little swirl of a mix of clotted blood or, or air bubbles um, within the chambers of the heart, again demonstrating no cardiac contractility. And again, most of the literature on this topic would suggest that uh, in the setting of pulselessness, the lack of cardiac contractility is essentially not a survivable event.
and yet one more example here where the uh, practitioner had their probe ready in the subxiphoid area. That's why we don't see the image in the beginning here. And then when the uh, chest compression stopped to allow for the pulse check, um, you can then quickly manipulate the probe to the point of being able to see the heart. And there's just sort of a gentle swirl of fluid in the heart, uh, probably left over from the chest compressions, and certainly no cardiac activity in this particular code. Um, M-mode can also be used to demonstrate this. Um, it's not the happiest version of how to use M-mode. Cardiologists and other providers typically like to use M-mode to look through the mitral valve or demonstrate uh, chamber sizes and use it for other purposes. But uh, an M-mode line straight through a heart that's not beating will, pro will uh, uh, demonstrate flat lines, as we can see here. So... Um, Let's uh, speak for a bit about the inferior vena cava as part of the cardiovascular system here. Um, two major questions we want to ask of the inferior vena cava. What's its diameter? And is there any respiratory variation? And again, these two simple findings can prove incredibly powerful when looking at uh, a general assessment of the fluid status of the patient, or more applicably, um, to ask the question, will this patient's cardiac output respond if, uh, or increase if I give a fluid bolus? So by focusing on a very practical question, increased cardiac output with the administration of a fluid bolus, uh, we can probably get some more accurate answers than if we were just holding the IVC uh, up to try to mimic results of the uh, central venous pressure, which is falling a bit out of favor in critical care circles anyway. So here's how we look at it. In a transverse plane, we would uh, hold the probe roughly in the subxiphoid area, and we would see demonstrated the aorta, the inferior vena cava, and the anterior aspect of the lumbar spine. Since it's such a bright reflector because it's bone, instead of looking like a circle like the vertebral bodies should normally look, you basically only see the leading edge and then shadowing behind it. So since it's such a large structure, such a bright structure, and has shadowing towards the end of it, it, uh, it actually serves as an excellent landmark to try to find the aorta as well as the inferior vena cava in the transverse view. More typically, however, people look at a longitudinal view. So if you find that transverse view, bring the inferior vena cava to the middle of your screen and then rotate 90 degrees, we are now holding the probe marker facing the patient's head so that we can see the liver in the near field. There's a hepatic vein here. It's draining into the inferior vena cava, and up here we have the right atrium. So one way uh, of finding this, again, is to rotate the transverse view that we just had. Another way is to locate a subxiphoid cardiac view and focus in on the right atrium and then trace the right atrium inferiorly until it uh, opens up into the inferior vena cava. So at about the level of the confluence of the hepatic veins, just distal to the right atrium, that's the spot where we want to look at the diameter of the inferior vena cava. So the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography has guidelines on the evaluation of the right heart, and part of what they had written about was the evaluation of right atrial pressures using the inferior vena cava as a guide. So while looking at the primary literature that helped create this table shows a bit messier data than this table would suggest, it's very helpful in the extremes to think about a low right atrial pressure corresponding to an inferior vena cava diameter that's less than 2.1 centimeters, and a change in diameter with respirations of greater than 50%. So that's typically going to correspond to a low right atrial pressure. Or, to put it very um, practically in terms of caring for patients in the ICU or the emergency department or on the medical floors, that is a patient that will respond well to a fluid bolus, and we're certainly not fluid overloaded. In the other extreme, we've got a dilated inferior vena cava, greater than 2.1 centimeters at the level of the uh, confluence of the hepatic veins, and less than 50% change in diameter. So it's big, and it's not changing very much with respirations. That's a patient that you could either describe as being fluid overloaded, or certainly a patient who's not going to increase their cardiac output in the setting of administering fluids. And then somewhere in the middle, it's probably a bit less helpful. You can either have a small diameter inferior vena cava, as seen in the second row of this table, um, yet it uh, uh, um, doesn't collapse very much, and that probably corresponds to a medium right atrial pressure. Or you could have a larger inferior vena cava, but one that collapses, and again, that probably corresponds to a middle of the road uh, right atrial pressure. So on its own, inf uh, inferior vena cava diameter is probably the most helpful in its extremes of range, and it's certainly most helpful when it's correlated to um, a view of the heart. 
you look at the contractility, and if you see a hypercontractile heart in a patient who's hypotensive and tachycardic, you see that their IVC diameter is small, that their uh, IVC collapses with respirations, that patient needs fluid. In contrast, if you see a, uh, a hypotensive tachycardic patient with poor cardiac contractility and a large IVC that's not changing with uh, respirations, that patient is probably not going to respond to fluids and more likely needs inotropic support. So let's have a look at uh, a normal inferior vena cava here, okay? Again, it's less than 2.1 centimeters. We see the right atrium here and the inferior vena cava there. We see the hepatic vein coming into it. So that's the area that we want to focus on. Here we see a dilated inferior vena cava, and in this particular patient, they had uh, congestive heart failure, pericardial effusion, which you can get a little hint of here outside the inferior aspect of the heart, uh, dilated inferior vena cava, and poor respiratory variation. Here we see very little respiratory variation, and this is not just with a spontaneously breathing patient. This patient was actually even asked to, to sniff. So even with sniffing, there's not a 50% change in the diameter of this inferior vena cava. And it's also larger than 2.1 centimeters. So this, again, would be fluid overload. Patients not going to increase their um, cardiac contractility or, or their uh, cardiac output with a fluid bolus administration. Here as well, very little change in respiration uh, in, in terms of the diameter of the inferior vena cava, and the IVC is of a larger diameter. Another example of IV IVC plethora. In contrast here, we see a narrow IVC, less than 2.1 centimeters, and with just normal respirations, the IVC is collapsing down to the point of almost being obliterated. So this patient is, um, uh, needs volume. You can use M-mode to measure out uh, the exact diameter of uh, the IVC during the respiratory cycle. Basically look at the largest diameter and the smallest diameter and see whether there's a 50% change or not. For 50%, when you get the hang of it, I think a lot of people find that they could uh, just eyeball it and get a rough sense of 50%. Um, it's much harder to do other percentages uh, just by looking at it, but 50 is not too bad. And you can see here, this is M-mode through the IVC that does not demonstrate a 50% collapse. Okay, so we spoke about the heart, spoke about the inferior vena cava, and especially um, the power of being able to use both of these together to get an assessment of the patient's um, uh, cardiac contractility, the presence of effusion, and um, whether a fluid bolus is going to be of use to them or not. So combining an assessment of their cardiac contractility, hypodynamic versus hypercontractile heart, IVC, plethoric versus flat. Um, you can really get a good sense if your hypotensive tachycardic patient needs fluids or inotropic support. Please be sure to visit sinaiem.us for any other questions, comments, uh, email me or contact me through the uh, website. There's additional tips, tricks, tutorials, etc. that are available on that site. Thank you.